Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Philosophy. My name is Professor Paul Hicks, and today we are going to talk about language and sexuality. Uh, this is going to be a paper by the philosopher Robert Baker. The paper is entitled Pricks and Chicks, A Plea for Persons. So he starts this paper out by saying, there is a school of philosophers who believe that one starts philosophizing not by examining whatever it is one is philosophizing about, but by examining the words we use to designate the subject to be examined. I must confess my allegiance to this school. So he's going to try to defend four different theses. The first one is the way in which we identify something reflects our conception of it. The second one is the conception of women embedded in our language is male chauvinistic. The third one is the conceptual revisions proposed by the feminist movement are confused. And the fourth one is the roots of the problem are both our conception of sex and the very structure of sexual identification. So to go ahead and illustrate one, he talks about how expressions of African Americans have been used, say, by Southerners. And he's going to call this Southern white paternalism. Um, a simplified version of this thesis is as follows. Any term that could be meaningfully substituted for X in a statement is a term used to identify something. So think about this. So imagine you know, that the United States is a racist society, right? Try really, really hard here. Um, so imagine there's these two white Southerners, and one of them says to the other, who is that boy Jim's got working for him down at the filling station? Now, what do we mean here? What can we understand what these people think when they say, who's that boy working down at the filling station? If by boy you mean uh, a male child, then it's perfectly okay to say that. But the problem is, when they said the word boy, they were referring to an adult African-American man. So by calling an adult African-American man boy, what's happening? What can we tell about their thinking just by the word choices that they use? Um, well, when we apply the word boy to African-American adult men, what that's reflecting is a certain position that people believe that African-Americans are childlike, they're immature, they're unable to take care of themselves, they need guidance. This is what um, Baker calls this white paternalism, right? We look at uh, non-white people as childlike, as immature, and that they need white people to take care of them and to be in control and to be in charge. And it's this type of language and this type of thinking which supports the white supremacy that we uh, see all around us. See, until the 1960s, there were respectable terms for African-American. For example, the word Negro used to be the very respectable term. Colored was one. Of course, there were very disreputable uh, terms by which people referred to African-American men and women as, say, the N-word, spook, kink, or something like that. But now as we have replaced uh, all of those words, right? We have replaced these words. Nobody says those words anymore, um, or they're not supposed to say those words. See, now we say things like African-American or simply black. That's the word that I think most people probably use nowadays. Now, I want you to notice something here, is we are referring to African-Americans as black. Now, what am I? Right? I am supposed to be referred to as white. Notice that white and black are antonyms. You notice that they're opposites. Right? Our conception of race relations is going to be consistent with these terms. The oppositeness of these linguistic terms, they reflect the oppositeness of the dominant culture and the minority. Right? Why do we say black versus white? Right? Why do we use these actual colors? So, for example, in the black movement, during the civil rights movement, there was a call for the abandonment of nonviolence in favor of black power, like said by Stokely Carmichael, or that integration must be abandoned in favor of separation. Here you had people like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, uh, that blacks are an internal colony in the alien world who must arm themselves against the possibility of extermination. Right? These are people like the Black Panthers saying this. Now, of course, here's the thing. We're not actually white or black. Right? So these terms, in a sense, are just metaphorical. Right? I'm not actually white. I'm probably more peaches or kind of a pink uh, on some spots. 
right? And it would be absolutely absurd to say that black people are actually black. But what do white and black actually mean to us? Notice that when we talk about black, we talk about things like, say, black male, black bald, right? We, we, we look at these kinds of terms, and black is synonymous with things like deadly, sinister, wicked, evil. So, for example, um, there, a while ago, there was a movie by, um, uh, called Ghost with Patrick Swayze. And at the very end of the movie... I'll give you a little spoiler alert here. At the very end of the movie, the uh, bad guy, right, is going to be taken down to the demons. Now, how are the demons actually represented? Well, they were represented by black smoke coming up out of the ground and grabbing the bad guy. Right? This was seen as wicked. This was identifying black with something negative. Now, of course, when Patrick Swayze was supposed to go up to heaven and go up to the good place... How is it that the smoke was different, that whisked him up to heaven? It was all white. And so we automatically know that black was supposed to be bad and white is supposed to be good, right? This is what we think. Think of um, like, um, say, a wedding dress, for example. Imagine you go to a wedding and the bride is dressed in all black. That would be kind of odd, wouldn't it? What would you think about a wedding where the bride was dressed in all black? Why is it that the bride is supposed to be white? What does white symbolize for us? Right? White symbolizes things like innocence, purity. These are good things, or at least they're considered good things. Where do you wear black to? A funeral, right? Something considered a bad thing. And so white and black, once again, are at play here. Um, so... You know, white is considered to be innocent and pure, whereas black is synonymous with sinister and bad. So there's a connection here in the way that we identify something and the way that we actually conceive it. So in English, our language is actually permeated by separating genders. So for example, if, um, you know, if I was to say, you know, my wife and I just had a baby, what do you think the number one question people are going to ask? What gender is it? Is it a boy or is it a girl? Now, maybe they won't come out and ask that, but they might ask, what is the name of the baby? And couldn't you tell somebody's gender just by the name, by the first name? Do we give certain first names to males and certain first names to females? So why do we do this, right? It seems rather important that we should be able to know who's a male or who's a female without really having to ask. Uh, we do the same thing when we talk about pronouns. So we look at he or we look at she. So uh, Baker asks us to imagine, imagine there's a culture who did not identify pronouns based off gender, such as he or she, but rather based off of age. That is, they were either over 30 or under 30. So for example, if a neighbor came over and said, hey, what college did your under go to? Right? It would immediately understand that that person was under the age of 30. Okay, now why do you think, what would you be able to tell about a society who separates people by age as by being over 30 or under 30? Well, it seems rather clear that that society holds age to be important. Whatever it is and why it is, we may not know. But just by the fact that they identify everybody as either over 30 or under 30 tells us that they actually feel that the age of somebody is important for somebody to know just by linguistically talking about them. Well, how do we separate people? Our pronouns are by gender. Our proper names are by gender. So um, think about other terms. So notice how the word man is often equated with all of humanity. You never notice that mankind is synonymous with humanity, but womankind is not. See, man can be substituted in any sentence for humanity or mankind, but woman cannot. So look at the following expressions here, right? The first one, humanity's greatest achievements, right? We could say man's greatest achievements or mankind's greatest achievements. But notice that if we took out that word man and we replaced it with woman and said womankind's greatest achievements or woman's greatest achievement, notice here we mean something very, very different here, correct? 
Uh, we do this in many, many ways. So I might, you know, say, start a video, say, hi, guys, how are you doing? But what if I was to say, hey, gals, how are you doing? Is there a difference between those two? You notice that we can subsume being a woman under the masculine. That is, I could say the word, hey, guys, and that includes all women. But if I was to say, hey, gals, it doesn't include all men. It would be inappropriate for me to say, hey, gals, when I refer to all people, both men and women. But it's not inappropriate for me to say, hey, guys. Why is that? Well, I think the reason why that is, is because it's always okay to subsume women under the masculine term, but it's never okay to subsume men under the feminine term. And the reason being is because being a man and being masculine is really super important to somebody, and they can't be ever seen as the feminine, because the feminine is seen as nothing, or it's seen as the other, it's seen as less than or inferior or something like that. And men don't want to be seen as inferior. So as such, we don't actually do that, right? Um, think of an old philosophical terms, like going back to Aristotle, when they tried to define what it means to be a human, they'll say, man is a rational animal. Now, of course, for Aristotle, he meant those with penises. But when we talk about man is a rational animal, we call this a truism. But now if we were to say woman is a rational animal, that can be debated. We, we often hear things like women are more emotional than men. Men are more rational than women. Right? And so there's going to be some sort of debate when we say woman is a rational animal, but we're not going to have that debate when we say man is a rational animal. Notice what we're doing is we're privileging one gender over another. Um, so here's a very interesting thing that Robert Baker did. He said, let's consider a question. The question is, who is that woman over there? All right. Now, I want you to do me a favor. Take out the word woman in that sentence and replace it with another word that, such that the sentence itself keeps the same meaning. What word would you actually replace woman with? Once again, such that it keeps the same meaning in the sentence. Well, here's what Robert Baker found out. Men and women answer the question very differently. Women will refer to other women typically, not always, but typically in what we'll call neutral terms. They will say, instead of look at that woman over there, they'll say, look at the lady over there. Look at that gal over there, right? Well, these are all terms that don't seem derogatory in any sort of way. I mean, sure, lady has a bit of a class connotation to it, right, that you're supposed to be, a, it's an upper class woman or somebody like that. But nonetheless, they're not negative, right? They're not putting a woman down. Now, unfortunately, men answer this question in a very different way. So how do men answer this question? Well, men, they're going to call women uh, different things. So for example, when, men will often refer to women as if they're animals, so, for example, a man will look at the sentence, look at that woman over there, and replace it with what word? Look at that chick over there. Look at that bitch over there. Uh, look at that fox over there. Look at that broad over there. You know what the word broad means? It just means pregnant cow. Right? It just means pregnant cow. So these are all terms that are animal terms. And this is the way that men refer to women. And men aren't consciously thinking women are literally a baby bird. But nonetheless, the term chick seems to apply to women. And even if you won't call women chicks and bitches, the fact that you know when somebody says, hey, look at that chick over there, that they're not referring to a baby bird, which say something about the way our culture has allowed for this type of language to be uh, and this kind of thinking to be permeated throughout society. Another thing uh, group that men will refer to women as is as playthings. So for example, a babe or doll. It's a little old timey now, but still, you know, hey doll, I'm not referring to an actual toy here, right? Other things might just be something which is associated with gender. So skirts. So, for example, if I told you, you know, last weekend I was out chasing skirts, what did, what did I mean? 
if I'm chasing skirts, you notice that you automatically know that I'm talking about chasing women, right? All and all I said was the word skirt. So once again, the woman, the person is taken out of language and they're just an object now. Now, of course, we could go a little further and men will also refer to women as sexual terms. So somebody will say, um, look at that piece of ass, right? Or um, look at those tits over there. Or they might say, hey, she's a slut. Look at that whore over there. These are all going to be sexual terms now, right? And we're identifying these individuals based on purely sexual terms. What can we think of what men think of women simply by looking at the word choices they actually use? So, um, right, we refer to women not as neutral terms, but as playthings, gendered items, animals, or just pure out sexual terms. Look, even if these terms are not frequently used, what's important is if they are standard enough to be recognized as a term of identification, right? So based upon the words we use, ask yourself this, what conception do men have of women? What conception do men have of women when we're talking about all of those words that we just used? All right, well, women are just seen as objects. They're seen as things which are inferior to men, things that men shall use. Well, think about that. If all the words that we refer to women as, and to us, we're not, we may not be thinking horrible thoughts when we say these words, but if all the words we refer to women as are as objects that we use for ourselves and that their only value is as a tool for us, what do we really think of women? Do men respect women? Right? Where is he going wrong here, if anywhere? Um, so, you know, for example, um, all the animals or animals which are domesticated for servitude to men or are hunted by men, think of the word chick. All right. So let's go ahead and think of the word chick for just one moment. What bird, right? Chick is a baby bird. What bird do you immediately think of first when you hear, hear the word chick? The number one answer that men will refer to or will say about this is they think of the chicken, right? Notice what they don't think of. They don't think of, say, an owl. Why? What does the owl represent in our society? Wisdom. They don't talk about an eagle or a falcon or a hawk. These are predator birds. Uh, they seem majestic to us. They're regal. Right? And we don't want to call women anything like that, of course. Uh, we don't talk about peacocks or swans. Right? I mean, just think about what they mean. Right? They're beautiful. They're graceful. You know, but when we think of the word chick, we don't think of anything like that. We don't think of a dove, a symbol of peace. No. We think of the chicken. We think of the chicken. Why is this important? Why is it important when we talk about uh, the word chick and it being chicken. Well, what role does the chicken play for us in our society? We eat them, right? They, they play no other role except to be used by us. We don't look at them as being majestic. In fact, we think of chickens as stupid. Okay, well, let's think about um, um, the word, say, fox or vixen. That's kind of a word not used anymore. That's just a female fox. Um, they, for the most part, will mean the same thing. What do we think about foxes? What role does the fox play? Does the fox represent anything to us? Right? I mean, foxes are considered intelligent. So in some ways, it's synonymous with being outsmarted. I could say I was outfoxed by that person. In other words, that they had me... Uh, they, they said something smarter than I did. Um, notice that this keeps a predator-prey model, right? What is it that we do in our culture? What role does the fox play? We hunt them. We hunt foxes. 
So the role that foxes actually play in our society is for us to hunt. Now think about this. Do men prey on women? When we talk about, say, um, you know, men chasing women, right? We talk about men as if they are predators and the women are prey. So maybe what we think about fox is that we look at women as prey and men as predators. That's one possibility. Another is think about the term fox as being sly. Sly as a fox, right? That's equivalent to words like cunning, crafty, sneaky, deceptive. This is important because if you look through the history of philosophy and the way that male philosophers have talked about women, one of the very common uh, complaints about women is men say that women are liars. So now when you understand that the history of identifying women by men is that women are liars, now we say she's a fox. And by fox, we mean deceptive, cunning, lying. You notice how the way we think about women and the word choices we use to refer to women are now connected? See, so the first two categories consider women just to be toys or animals who serve men, right? What is this? So just as when we we're talking about African-Americans, uh, males being referred to as boy, and African-American women being referred to as girl, and that was white paternalism, Baker says when we talk about women as chicks and bitches, we are having what we call male paternalism, right? Men needing to be in charge, women needing to be taken care of. Now, this is important because in our society, who do we see as being in charge? Men. The religions that are dominant in our society, say Christianity, for example, talks about women must submit to their husbands. So this way of thinking permeates our language and we can examine the language that we use to undercover the thinking that we believe when it comes to the relations between men and women, right? Okay, so let's go on a little bit further here and talk about um, uh, sexual intercourse here, right? And sex, sexual objectification. So let's take this sentence here. Men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Is that a true statement or a false statement? Men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Okay, why is this a true statement? I certainly hope you think this is a true statement. If you don't, then we're going to have to talk about other things first. But let's say that this is a true statement. Men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Why? Why is this a problem? What does this mean when we say this? Right? What do we talk about when women, when the, right, he calls this the feminist mantra. When feminists are saying men ought not to think of women as sex objects, what are they trying to say? Well, there's a couple ways that uh, we could possibly interpret this. Maybe um, when we talk about a sex object, that men should refrain from thinking of women in a way where a sex is considered dirty, right? So um, think about it this way. Um, you know, you get down and dirty. You don't get down and clean, do you? When you're having sex, right? Or think about uh, a maybe a woman that's had a lot of sex. People will refer to her as being dirty or nasty or diseased or something like that. So maybe when feminists say men ought not to think of women as sex objects, what they're saying is that men should not think of women as something that are diseased or something that should be untouched or something that is disgusting. Um, the problem, unfortunately, with thinking of it that way is that really most people don't think that way. I mean, unless you're a Puritan of some sort, right? We don't literally think those things. So that would be a, the wrong interpretation of men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Okay, maybe when we think of this sentence, men ought not to think of women as sex objects, what we're really saying is that men should not view women exclusively as sexual partners. Is that what we're supposed to, to understand? Um, there's a problem here because once again, men don't think of all women as sexual partners. For example, they have mothers and sisters, right? Um, even then, if we were to 
interpret this as saying men should not think of women exclusively as sexual partners as if they're not good for anything else. There's a problem in doing that. Specifically, if we were to imagine the most male chauvinistic man that we can, right? Think of that person. Even the most male chauvinistic man does not think that all women are just there for sex. Why? Well, because for the perspective of the male chauvinistic man, women are good for other things. Cooking, cleaning, right? Taking care of the house, etc. Raising children. So even the most male chauvinistic man does not actually believe that women are just there for sex or or sexual objects. So that, uh, Baker thinks, is not the appropriate, proper way of reading the statement, men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Um, Maybe what feminists have a problem with is the idea of being an object. So think about being, say, a sex object that is just a thing, a thing that has no interest. Compare that now to saying a sex subject, where somebody actually has desires and they actually have interests. And so maybe when we say men ought not to think of women as sex objects, is that we should think of them as having their own desires and their own interests. Um, Right? When we think of the term object, um, when we think of a man uh, objectifying a woman, we don't want them to think of women as being inanimate machines right? A sex object is something that one might masturbate with, right? But we don't want that to be understood uh, uh, for women, right? So think about other terms that we use. Um, Think about uh, men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Think of it as something that we shouldn't count the number of sexual experiences that we have, right? So We often think about uh, the relationship between men and women. We talk about it as a game. For example, we might say he has game or he is a player, right? What is he a player of? He's a player of the game. He has game. What does that mean? He's able to get women, right? That's what it means to have game. That's what it means to be a player. And of course, if he does get a woman, then he scored with her. You notice that we're, once again, we're having all these words around a very similar way of thinking, right? So what's wrong with all of that? Well, maybe women don't want to think of, be thought of as just objects by which men can score with. Um, This is going to fail, according to Baker, because this interpretation is pretty restricted, that is, you know, yeah, maybe you might have some frat boys that believe something like that, but most men really don't think like that, do they? Um, so the charge becomes that men treat women as sex objects rather than as persons. The problem, though, is the universality of men uh, is lacking in this interpretation. Um, you know, one may be attempted to argue that since men identify women as animals and playthings, that women really are just seen as objects. You know, for example, it might be argued that the female fox is chased and slayed if she is four-legged, but chased and laid if she is two. All right. Um, For many of the other terms we call women really aren't sexual at all, right? So, for example, if we were to call a woman a broad, which is just a pregnant cow, that doesn't seem really erotic to me. Um, Babies don't excite uh, sexual passion, or at least it really shouldn't. Um, right? Men do not normally have erotic interests when it comes to chicks and bitches. So then what is clear is that the animals and playthings to whom women are assimilated are not symbols of eroticism, desire, or passion. So the point then is that men should not think of women as sexual partners, but men ought to think of women as human beings. The slogan, men should not think of women as sex objects, is only appropriate when a man thinking of a woman as a sexual partner automatically conceives of her as something as less than human. All right. Um, All right. So I want to go ahead and start, you know, thinking about sexual intercourse itself just a little bit, because this is going to help answer the question of why men should not think of women as sex objects. Right. So we're going to think of um, sex for just a bit, the actual act of sexual intercourse. So let's imagine that 
you are out with a group of friends on a Friday night, and there's a couple, Jack and Jill. Now, Jack and Jill and you and your friends are out at a club one night, but see, Jack and Jill want to leave early, and they're going to go home and have sex. Now, the next morning, all of your friends meet up, and you want to talk about what Jack and Jill did last night. What would you say? How would you actually say it? And what word choices were would you use? Well, it's rather interesting, I think, of the word choices that people use. So for example, um, somebody might say, uh, Jack fuck Jill. How about this? Jack screwed Jill. Jack did it with Jill. Jack banged Jill. Right? Okay. Notice though, these words, right? Screwed, fucked, had, did it to, banged, right, is that Jack is banging Jill. We don't say Jill is banging Jack. So when we say Jack fucks Jill, this is not synonymous with Jill fucks Jack. When we say Jack fucks Jill, we're saying that Jill was fucked by Jack, right? And notice what's actually happening here is we have an active participant and a passive participant. The man is active and the woman is passive. That is, Jack is doing the fucking and Jill is getting fucked, right? Jack is doing the screwing and Jill is getting screwed. Now, there are some ways that we could talk about sexual intercourse where it's not active and passive and we can switch that around. So, for example, if we were to say, made love to, slept with, Jack slept with Jill, that seems to be synonymous with Jill slept with Jack. Jack made love to Jill seems to be synonymous with Jill made love with Jack. But certain words, fuck, screwed, had, did it to, banged, that always seems to require that the man was doing it to the woman. But why? Why is this? Why is it that it's always the man who is acting and the woman is always being passive? Well, let's take a look at these words. Um, Fuck, screw, had, bang, did it to. What are these words synonymous with? You notice, say, if I was to say something along the lines of, um, you know, let's say I went to a tire shop and... I paid for the $300 tires, but they gave me the $100 tires. Now, when I get home, I notice they gave me the $100 tires. Now I might say something like, you know what? I was fucked over. I was screwed by the tire shop. I was had. Right? You begin to notice something here? So when we say certain words like screw, fucked, had, did it to, banged, it's always also synonymous with the word harm always synonymous with the word harm. But when we say things like Jack makes love to Jill or Jill makes love to Jack or Jack slept with Jill or Jill slept with Jack, those can be interchanged because those words don't mean harm. Only when the words mean harm is that the man has to be active and the woman has to be passive. Now, some of you might say, wait a second here. Um, You're kind of going overboard here, right? So you might say, think about screw, and that when we think about um, screwing, that Jack screws Jill, that maybe this is about anatomy, right? That the male penis is kind of like a screw, and it goes into a woman, and that it's just really anatomical when we say screw. But there's a problem with reading it that way, because see, we could conceptualize verbs that indicate copulation with metaphors that women do to men. So for example, why don't we say Jill really engulfed Jack? We could say that, but we don't say that. Right? We don't say she engulfed him. Right? We can say these anatomical things, but the the fact is is we just don't do it. And this is rather important. Right? Because once again, all of these words of where men do it to women are all synonymous with harm. All right, if you don't see this, then let's go ahead and uh, try to you know, build up this case just a little bit here. So imagine that um, you know, it's the holiday season, you go to a mall, 
and you notice that all of the spots are taken. You're driving around looking for a parking spot. And what do you do? You see somebody walking to their car. And so you kind of follow them to their car, right? Um, now let's say you're following them to the car. You're waiting them for them to put all their packages into the car. You're sitting there as patiently as you possibly can. And after several minutes, they finally pull out. Let's say that once they pull out, before you were able to pull in, somebody else came and took that parking spot from you. Are you mad? What do you want to do? Imagine now that you're going to get out of your car and you're going to tell this person that you want to tell them how angry you are. That is that you want to actually hurt them, but you're not actually going to hurt them. You're just going to do it linguistically. What would you say to them? Hey, fuck you. Screw you. Up yours. Right? You might clench your fist and maybe raise a middle finger. But you notice, what does this look like? When you raise your middle finger like this, what does it look like? It's a phallic symbol. This is a phallic symbol. This is why we raise our middle finger. In other words, I want you to be harmed. And my way of expressing how I want you to be harmed is that you take the female sexual role relative to me. Right? To say, go fuck yourself. What am I saying here? That's just a way of saying to go harm yourself. Notice, too that we might say, hey, you motherfucker. Why do we say motherfucker? Why don't we say father fucker or cousin fucker, sister fucker, right? We never say any of those. Motherfucker seems to be the right word, but father fucker is not. Why is that? Well, let's think about this for just a minute. Uh, when you were younger, did you ever make your mama jokes? Why? See, what Robert Baker understands is that men are really a bunch of mama's boys and that we place mom up on a very high pedestal. And that when we say motherfucker, where to be fucking is harm, to call someone a motherfucker is to say you are such a low down dirty person that you would harm your own mother. And that's why motherfucker makes sense, but fatherfucker doesn't. Right? Um, you might call that person a prick. Okay, well, let's think about the prick. What is a prick? There is a couple different meanings for prick, right? There is a prick where we say the word prick and we mean penis. But there's also saying, let's take, I take a needle and I prick my finger. What did I do here? If I pricked myself with the needle, what did I do? I caused harm to myself. You notice here the language is, is keeping the same conceptual form, right? To prick your finger is to cause harm, and prick is also used as synonymous with male anatomy, male genitalia, right? This seems to be a bit of a problem. What's clear here is that the literal prick and the figurative prick are just agents of harm. So think about uh, different words that we might use. So um, if you maybe you're coaching, say, uh, a group of boys playing soccer. And you tell one of the boys, hey, you run like a girl. Was that a compliment? Why is running like a girl an insult? Do we have respect for women when we talk like this? I don't think so. All right, this is going to be a problem. We might talk about um, calling a, another man who lacks courage, that is, who lacks some sort of masculine virtue that we think they should have, we can call them a pussy. And what is a pussy? But pussy is also synonymous with female genitalia, but it's also synonymous with a weak man. Why? Are female genitalia really weak? I don't think so. Why is it that we hold out that the male genitalia is strong, but female genitalia is weak? In actuality, female genitalia is not weak, but male genitalia typically is, right? So if you were to kick a man in, uh, in between the legs, is he going to fall down? Is he going to hurt? Right? Where women's genitalia can do magnificent things, such as uh, delivering a baby. A man could never uh, imagine such a thing of that sort, right? So being a pussy in 
when we refer to female genitalia, should actually mean strong, but it doesn't mean that. Why? Let's go ahead and, and go a little bit further. Think about a term like a douchebag. You know, that guy's a real douche. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, we already know that it's bad to call, uh, to subsume men under the term of woman, right? I have to say guys, not gals, if I mean everybody. Um, so we already know it's not okay for men to be called a woman. We can't call a man, you're acting like a girl, you run like a girl, stop crying like a woman. We can't say anything like that, right? What are we actually saying? Right? When we're saying somebody is a douche, what is a literal douche? It's supposed to be a cleaning agent uh, for women's vagina. Now, of course, actually using actual douches aren't not what should be done, but you know, you know, they are self-cleaning organs. But um, think about that for a bit. To call somebody a douche is not just to call somebody a woman or a girl. It's not just to call them female genitalia, such as a pussy, but that you're a dirty, stinky, nasty one at that. That's what it means to be a douche. Notice the conceptual framework that we have when talking about these issues. So look, if you don't think um, this is true, that we don't look at uh, sex as something that men do to women, let's do a little intuition priming if we can here. So imagine that there's two doors, and in front of each door, there is a line of people. And behind each door, there is a person laying down on a bed. Now, in door number one, there is a man lying on the bed, and the line consists of beautiful women. Each woman who comes in, in turn, walks into the room and has sex with the man. What do we think of this scene? What do we think of this man? Are you thinking like, oh, poor dude. Oh, that's awful, having to have sex with all these beautiful women. That is just terrible, isn't it? We don't think that. We think of him as lucky. Hey, isn't that an awesome experience that he's having? Notice here, the man's not being harmed. He's not being violated. We think of the experience as pleasurable for the man. Now let's go ahead and look at door number two. With door number two, there is a woman lying on the bed, and there's a long line of men who are one by one going in there, having sex with her and leaving. Now what do we think of this particular scene? You notice immediately we start to think that she's being raped. We immediately start to think that something bad is happening here. Why? Isn't it possible that women like to have sex? Isn't it possible that women might want to have sex with a bunch of good-looking men? Sure it is. But why does it feel different to us? Why does one line where it's women having sex with a man seems perfectly appropriate and exciting, but the other line where men are having sex with a woman, we think immediately that she's being harmed and she's in danger. Or we think, oh, that poor woman. Right? When a man fucks many women, he's a playboy and he gains status. But when a woman is fucked by many men, she degrades herself and she loses stature. Right? Why? So let's go back if we can in order to get into this conclusion, right? To say that um, men ought not to think of women as sex objects. Okay, so what are we saying here now that we've gone through all of these uh, use of words when it comes to sexual intercourse? When we say that men ought not to think of women as sex objects, we're not talking about um, anything that we were saying before. We're talking about men shouldn't look at women as something to be harmed. Men shouldn't look at women as something that they can use and harm for their own desires and pleasures. This is what we're talking about. And that only makes sense when you understand the word choices we use when we start to talk about sexual intercourse. So, look, if you, if you don't see this as men harming women, let's talk about what it means to be a man in our society and what it means to be a real man in our society. So look at the advertising slogans that... Um, um, say the military uses, right? We might say the Marines will make a man out of you or the Marines were looking for a few good men, right? Something like this. What is it that when we say the military will make a man out of you, what are we saying? What is the purpose of a military? The purpose of the military is to kill, is to harm, to blow things up. 
if they're not a good fighting force, they're a terrible military. The, in order to be a good military, you have to be a fighter. And so what we're saying is when the military will make a man out of you or the Marines are looking for a few good men, what we're saying is we're going to teach you how to kill. Right? So now we have to rethink this. So look, let's imagine if we can, right? Let's imagine if we can that there exists a racist society. Once again, try real, real hard here. In this racist society, white people will have their name, say, Joe Smith. But if the person is a person of color, they're not allowed to have the last name Smith. They actually had to add the suffix of, say, O. So while a white person might be called John Smith, uh, a non-white person would be called John Smith O. Right? Right? There might be a white person called Joe Beach, but uh, a non-white person would be called Joe Beacho. All right, you begin to see what I'm talking about here? All right. Let's say now that we want to get rid of racism as, out of our society, which I think is a certain noble cause to do. What do we have to do? What do we have to change about ourselves? We don't have to just change the fact that we're maybe having physical, uh, doing physical racist acts or creating racist institutions or something like that. Yeah, that might be important, and we're not denying that. But you have to change your language. You have to change your language. You have to start stop uh, calling non-white people with the suffix of O and make everybody equal. Okay, fine. Then what do we do when it comes to gender? Right? If we live in a sexist society, which we certainly do, and you want to end sexism, what do we need to do? Right? Change our language. And one of the things that we need to do, uh, especially as men, is to stop referring to women as chicks and bitches and sluts. Right? We need to change our language. We're not going to be able to succeed and we're not going to be able to have a, an egalitarian society until we do. So this is up to you. Are you willing to make the change? Are you willing to be the change that you see is so needed in this world? Can you change your language? All right. So um, that's Robert Baker. Uh, it's a very good paper. I hope you learned something by this lecture. And I will see you all next time. Alrighty, bye-bye.